Hi everyone, in today's tutorial I'm going to show you how to turn Epsom salt into 98% concentrated sulfuric acid. For this tutorial you will need some Epsom salt. Make sure that it is pure and unscented. You will also need some lead dioxide electrode. If you don't have one, simply watch my tutorial in which I explain how I made mine. You will also need a copper electrode. This is just some standard plumbing tube. And uh, you will have to make sure that these two electrodes are very clean. Don't touch them with your fingers. You don't want to add some grease to them. You will need a glass dish and finally a clay pot with no hole in it. All right, so I have here 262 grams of Epsom salt. I'm going to explain in a moment why I chose this uh, amount of Epsom salt. It's basically to simplify the calculations that I'm going to show. And I'm going to put some distilled water into the clay pot. distilled water and then I'm going to fill the uh, the glass dish with also distilled water and make sure that there is at least one liter so that all the Epsom salt can be dissolved now make sure that the copper electrode is clean and use it in order to dissolve the Epsom salt You don't need to dissolve all the Epsom salt right now. As we do the electrolysis, it will keep dissolving into the solution. Connect the copper electrode to a wire. All right. And then put the lead dioxide electrode into the clay pot. and uh, connect the lead dioxide electrode to the positive side of a power supply. Once again, this can be batteries, but I like to use um, an adjustable voltage supply. Right now I am applying 10 volts and I can see that I have 0.1 amp flowing. When I just turned it on, there was a zero current. That's perfectly normal because the distilled water in which the lead dioxide electrode is, is almost a perfect insulator. It's not perfectly insulating because since the temperature is not the absolute zero, there is still a slight ionization of the distilled water due to thermal activity and that uh, that is what lets the current flow into the, the, the distilled water but now the current has increased to 0.1 and because it started to form some sulfuric acid which is conductive okay so this current is going to increase as time passes so we are going to keep track of this. So now all we have to do now is to wait. And while we are waiting, let us do some calculations. I see many tutorials that limit the explanations to simply saying that sulfuric acid is produced at the anode while magnesium hydroxide is produced at the cathode. This is satisfactory for many people, but not for me. So let me try to explain this a little bit better. Initially, we have only water molecules, magnesium and sulfate ions in the cathode half cell. There are very few water molecules that dissociate into protons and hydroxide ions due to thermal energy. In the anode half cell, only water molecules are present, again with a few of them dissociating into protons and hydroxide ions. Now, at the cathode, we have several possibilities for the reactions and in principle the ones with the highest reduction potentials are the ones that are more likely. However, the three possibilities with the highest potentials involve protons but only a few of them are available. So these reactions don't significantly happen. 
Among the two remaining reactions, the last one is the most likely because it has the greatest reduction potential. Therefore, we conclude that water is reduced to produce hydrogen gas that bubbles out and hydroxide ions. At the anode, we also have several possibilities and in principle the first one with the highest oxidation potential is more likely. But this reaction requires hydroxide ions which initially are almost inexistent in this half cell. So this reaction does not significantly happen, at least not initially. Thus we have to look for the reaction with the next highest oxidation potential, which is the one in which water is oxidized to produce oxygen that bubbles out and protons that make the solution acidic. Now the role of the porous membrane, the clay pot, is to allow the two half cells to remain electrically neutral by letting ions flow from one half cell to the other, while preventing the movement of large volumes of solution. So, the two solutions don't mix up significantly, but because the ions can pass through the membrane, some reactions that initially were not likely can happen now. For example, in the cathode half cell, the reduction of protons is initially unlikely because protons are not available. However, protons are produced in the anode half cell and are very mobile, so they can easily move to the cathode half cell. But this doesn't generate any pollution of the solution since either these protons are now reduced into hydrogen gas that bubbles out, or they form with the sulfate ions some sulfuric acid that neutralizes the magnesium hydroxide to form again some Epsom salt. So these unwanted reactions don't generate any pollution. They simply slow down the overall production of sulfuric acid and magnesium hydroxide. To summarize, water is reduced at the cathode and the solution turns into magnesium hydroxide and water is oxidized at the anode and the solution turns into sulfuric acid. The membrane mainly lets the sulfate ions move from the cathode to the anode. The cell's potential is the sum of the reduction potential at the cathode and the oxidation potential at the anode and equal to negative 2.057 volts. Thus, the power supply must apply a voltage at least equal to positive 2.057 volts in order to force the reaction to occur. Now, why did I use 246 grams of Epsom salt? Simply in order to simplify the following calculations. The formula of Epsom salt is MgSO4-7H2O and from there we can easily find that its molar mass is 246 grams per mole. This means that I used precisely one mole of Epsom salt and this is also the number of sulfate ions. As a result, if all the sulfate ions could be turned into sulfuric acid, then we would end up with one mole of sulfuric acid. So this gives us an upper limit of the yield that we can expect. We will obtain dilute sulfuric acid that we can concentrate up to 98% simply by boiling the water off. Such concentrated sulfuric acid is known to have a molarity of 18.4 moles per liter. Since we have one mole of acid, we conclude that this corresponds to a volume of 54.4 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid. Once again, this is an upper limit. We will obtain much less, but hopefully a few milliliters. Finally, something important is how long should we let the electrolysis go? For each sulfate ion, Two protons must be produced to form one molecule of sulfuric acid and we saw that this requires two electrons. Thus, we need a total charge of two moles of electrons. Hence, we calculate two times the elementary charge times Avogadro's number, which gives a total charge of 192,970 coulombs. This corresponds to 53.6 ampere hour. In other words, if we maintain a current of 1 amp, then it will take 53.6 hours for the process to complete. In practice, the process will never complete because some secondary reactions take place and some protons leak out of the anode half cell, but this gives us the minimum time that we should wait. It has been one hour and there is now a current of 120 milliamps. We can see some reaction happening at the cathode and Almost all the Epsom salt has been dissolved. There's still a little bit left, so we can stir a little bit. We don't see 
any change in the clay pot but it should start to have some uh, sulfuric acid in it it should be a little bit acidic it has been 24 hours and now the current is about 1 amp so we can see that some um, magnesium hydroxide forms it's not fully dissolved and here I had to add water because it was almost empty so why was the water gone um, I have two hypotheses about this well first we know that the water is being oxidized at the anode and some uh, oxygen is escaping so that means that the amount of water is being uh, reduced and also since we are forming sulfuric acid which is a powerful dehydrant I guess that it attracts the water molecule very tightly so maybe this also contributes to decrease the volume because the, the density increases the mass density increases so uh, these are the possible explanations that I have. It has been 72 hours with a current greater than 1 amp for at least 52 hours. So I think this is the best we can do. So here we can see that the cathode has been covered with uh, magnesium hydroxide. And there is some undissolved one here. Um, it's definitely not pure because it's yellowish and it's supposed to be white so um, it can also be mixed up with some Epsom salt because some secondary reaction happens when some sulfuric acid from the anode compartment leaks into the cathode compartment and it may react with the magnesium hydroxide in order to produce again some Epsom salt so I have here over a hundred mils of supposedly sulfuric acid as you can see it's pink so I suspect that these are clay particles um, I tried to filter but uh, it didn't work so uh, my filter is probably not fine enough um, so well anyway that's what we have so far so first thing let us check that it is acidic so let me put a drop on this paper yes we have here a nice red color nice red color and let's see not sure if it's pH 1, 2, 3, 4, it's hard to tell. But definitely it is acidic. Now before concentrating the acid, let us first estimate its current concentration. So I'm going to make a very rough estimate. Uh, rough estimate because I cannot measure volume very precisely and also since our acid is polluted uh, it won't be completely accurate okay so uh, here I'm going to measure the mass of five milliliters of this sulfuric acid so now my scale is zero I don't know if we can see it on the camera and I'm going to put five mils so I'm going to adjust the amount with a pipette so, So 5 mils and this is 5.26 grams so that means it's about 
1.05 milli sorry 1.05 grams per milliliter and if i look at an online table uh, today's temperature is 30 degrees so if i look at a table of concentration this corresponds to about eight percent concentration all right so now i'm going to put this acid into a flask and boil the water off in order to concentrate it and in order to reach the maximum concentration of 98 percent we need to heat the acid up to a temperature of 337 degrees celsius so that's really hot all right so i have my sulfuric acid here and let me turn on the heater to the maximum i have a thermometer and when the temperature will reach 337 degrees celsius then the acid will have reached its maximum concentration right now the temperature is about 120 degrees celsius so we have some water that is boiling off and it will take a while before the temperature rises and uh, reaches 337 degrees celsius so just be patient all the water needs to go away for the temperature to be able to rise so the temperature reached 337 degrees i let it cool off and i end up with this so there's a lot of pollution but we might be able to decant it uh, also we can notice that the pink color went away so maybe those impurities have been boiled away i don't know uh, and as expected we don't have much less so first let me try to pour everything in this beaker and then i will try to decant it and this should be more or less 98 percent concentrated sulfuric acid so we are going to make a test for that all right so i have about five milliliters of almost 98 percent sulfuric acid it's not super pure but it must be able to do the job so let us make a test i have here a napkin and let me pour a little bit on it yeah nice look at this look at this We have concentrated sulfuric acid now of course this is not much of it but we can scale everything up in order to make more okay so if you like this video please give it thumbs up write a comment and if you haven't done so subscribe to my channel thanks for watching